example, the, the good, the bad news, it says, uh, is human evolution finally over? And this, this is a scientific document, or a document put out by scientists. Scientists are split over the theory that natural selection has come to a standstill in the West. You already smell a rat there. For those who dream of a better life, scientists have, ha the, uh, scientists have bad news. This is the best it's going to get. Our species has reached its biological pinnacle and is no longer capable of changing. Now this is the stark controversial view of a group of biologists who believe a Western lifestyle now protects humanity from the forms that used to shape Homo sapiens. If you want to know that uh, what utopia looks like, just look around, this is it. Said Professor, said Professor Stephen Jones, the University of College in London, who is to present his argument at a Royal Society in Edinburgh debate, is evolution over? Next week, things have, uh, he's going to, he said things have uh, simply stopped getting better or worse for our species. There's a lot more on that. But anyway, I knew that that would encourage you to know that you've reached the peak. You're there. You be Bob. I knew that'd be a help to you. Uh, but you know what? <clears throat> I'll just bet you one of those Issaquah donuts <laughs> that this is nothing more than an attack on America. That's all it is. Because notice that the evolution has stopped in Western society, in our society, you see. And uh, so you've reached the top, and the only thing left is going down, I guess. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29, and um, look, if you will, at verse uh, 15. Genesis 29, 15. Tonight, I want to speak on the subject, how to find the right mate. How to find the right mate. And we have a pretty good crowd here tonight. So um, I'm sure that uh, you were wondering if you made the right choice. I'm sure especially the women have wondered that, <laughs> and probably the men. Uh, 29, <coughs> chapter 29, and uh, down about verse, uh, what did I say, 15, I believe. Uh, just read a few verses here. Uh, let me see, 29, 15. I didn't look right. I want uh, Jacob and uh, Laban. Is that right? 15. And behold, I am with thee. Oh, I'm wrong chapter, just wrong chapter. I thought, boy, the, this thing has changed since I left my office. <coughs> All right. 29, 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what thy wage sh uh, should be. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the one was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It's better that I should give her to thee than I should give her to another man. Notice that I should give her to thee than I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had uh, to her. And Jacob said unto uh, to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I should go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his, gave, uh, unto his daughter Leah Zilpha, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass, verse 25, that it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said unto Laban, What is this that you've done to me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, 
it must be uh, it must not be so done, uh, done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn fulfill her week and we will give thee this also for thy service which thou hast served with me yet seven other years and uh, now you know why uh, Jacob got his name uh, Jacob and uh, Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also and and so on now in verse 30 it says uh, and he went in unto Rachel and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served with him yet a seven more years turn over to Genesis chapter 24 <clears throat> back to the back chapter 24 and uh, look down about verse uh, uh, 63 63 and Isaac went out unto meditate in the field at evening tide and he lifted up his eyes and saw and behold the camels were coming and Rebekah lifted up her eyes and when she saw Isaac she lighted off her camel someone said that's the first record record of somebody smoking but she lighted off her camel uh, I just corrupted your mind on that text you'll never never be any any value to you there uh, in verse 65 uh, for she uh, had said unto the servant what man is that walking in the field to meet us and the servant said it is my master therefore she took a veil and covered herself and the servant told Isaac all things that he had done and Isaac brought her into his mother uh, Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her and Isaac was comforted from his mother's death the the methods of choosing or acquiring a mate certainly have to do with culture uh, everybody thinks their culture is right and think everybody else is strange um, but uh, there are many folks that believe the way we go about choosing a mate is irresponsible and uh, and um, certainly not uh, not proper but uh, the first thing <clears throat> I want to say to you about uh, choosing a mate is I need to change the title of my sermon uh, I the title is how to find the right mate and so what I did for point number one is to say there is no such thing as the right mate now I uh, there are some things that we can do to make uh, the right kind of choices and to make marriage uh, the trip of marriage or the journey in marriage a little bit better but you need to get it straight that God does not have just the right person out there for you a lot of folks think that God has got just the right person for me and um, and, and if you think that and you, you go down that road you're going to wonder next did I miss the one he had for me because once you've been married for a while you're going to find that the road is bumpy and uh, it's not what you thought it was going to be so if you get the concept that God in his foreknowledge predestined just the right person for you uh, you are going to wonder after you got married did Mr. Wright get away uh, I told this story every story I know I've told a hundred times in this church so if you've been here any length of time you've heard all the stories so just laugh anyway but I uh, had the story heard the story of two tears floating down the stream and one tear said to the other tear why are you here and she said my I lost my lover and why are you here she said I got him so let's just lay the myth aside at the beginning that God has the right perfect person out there for you he does not they don't exist and it'll help you if you'll see why I'm telling you this because marriage carries with it problems 
And if you have the theology or the philosophy that there is just that right person for me, you're always going to wonder, did I miss that person? Maybe it was the boyfriend that I should have married instead of the guy that I'm washing his clothes for now. You understand? And so you better get beyond that because that is a fallacy. There is nowhere in the Bible that teaches that God has just the right person for you that I know of. Now, if you find it, I'd like to know it. I'll, 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 I'll repent. The second basic in trying to find the right mate is be sure you find somebody of the opposite sex. When you are looking for the right mate, you better find somebody of the opposite sex. Now, that is a God-given truth. And... Uh, you know, I know, I know that the opposite sex can have emotion and love, or can love their own sex. I'm aware of that. I mean, you can love anything. Love is just an acquired or a learned emotion. You can get a poodle dog and keep it around, and you will love it. I had a lady, bless her heart, one Sunday morning right before I came to the pulpit, she came to me, she was in tears. I thought her mother had died. I thought maybe a kid, a grandchild or something, and she was broken. I said, what's wrong? She says, I'm having such a rough week. I said, why? She said, my little puppy died. <laughs> I wanted to say, get over it. But the Bible said, weep with those who weep. I said, that's so sad. Not really. I mean, I love animals. You know me. I, I, but I'm, I'm not going to weep over a dog dying. I, I, you know why you're going to weep over a dog dying? Because you love it. I'm saying that you can learn to love anything or anybody, but love alone is not the proper standard for selecting a mate. Love is not enough. Just because you love somebody or something doesn't make it the right choice. Well, mother, I love him. It's got to be the right choice. I wouldn't love him if it wasn't right. Yes, you would. You would. It's not the right choice to love the world, but the Bible's very clear that people love the world. And so keep in mind that just because you love a thing or a person or a place doesn't mean that that is the right thing, the right person, or the right place. Love is not the final criteria for choosing a mate. You will say to me before this message is over, physician, heal thyself. I'm not preaching from what I practiced. I'm preaching from what I've learned <laughs> that I should have practiced. If... Uh, uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would say that, uh, that we ought to find, that has nothing to do with this point, but we ought to find somebody of the same religion. In other words, I'm talking about the right mate. That doesn't be mean because they are of the same religion, they are the right mate. I don't mean that. I don't think just because somebody's a Baptist or a good choice might be the worst choice. I mean, a Methodist might be a better choice for a husband or a Presbyterian or something. I don't know. But I am saying that when you pick a mate, uh, your best, it's best if you pick somebody who has the same biblical persuasions that you have. I didn't say it was the only thing. There's an exception to everything. But I believe that, that uh, I think a, a Baptist uh, ought to marry a Baptist. I don't, think you, I, I don't think you ought to marry a Catholic until they get converted and come around. And that's nothing against Catholics. The Catholics teach the same thing. They teach they shouldn't marry you. So we're not discriminating against anybody. We're just, I'm just talking about that, that uh, for the, it's, it's best that you marry somebody who has the same uh, uh, kind of a Bible persuasion and, and uh, beliefs that you do. Now... 
you little girls, if a guy proposes to you, and you, and, and, and you girls are all too young for anybody to propose to you, but when you get old enough, you don't have to ask the guy, do you believe in dispensations? But that's, but, 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 but be close to that, okay? Uh, but, um, but I am saying that the guy needs to be saved, and uh, he, I'll say some more things about, uh, about other things, but um, <clears throat> you, ought to, uh, you ought to pick somebody that uh, is of the, in the biblical camp that you're in. Uh, God required that of Israel as a nation. That's certainly not a requirement of this church. I don't have any authority over anything you do, and I don't want any over it. I can't take care of myself, let alone try to, you know, run your life. But I am simply saying that uh, in the Old Testament, Israel was to marry within their nation. They were to marry within their people. They didn't always do that. They got in trouble. But you'd be wise to do that. That's why I believe in most cases it's good for kids to go maybe to a good Bible college for a year or two. Um, if you're going fishing, you go where the fish are. If you want to get catch the measles, you go where you can be exposed. And uh, sometimes it's good to... Uh, to go off uh, to Bible college to, to get a, a MR or MRS or something, get a degree. But, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Not a thing in the world wrong with it. You don't have to be called into the ministry or called to the mission field uh, to, uh, to go to a good Bible college if that's necessary. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, my son Randy went to Bible college, married, met his wife. He didn't meet her there. She followed him and uh, went to Bible college together. And uh, my son Rocky went to Bible college, met his, uh, met his wife there, uh, uh, Rocky, met Kim there. And um, usually that's what's gonna happen. If you go to a secular college, you're probably going to wind up with somebody in the college. If you uh, go to a Christian college, I mean, that's just the way the chemistry works. So try to find somebody along those lines if you can. You need to find someone of the same culture uh, in marriage. Do you know marriage problems between races have nothing to do with race? They have to do with culture. They're cultural problems. Now, I love my son, and I hate to use him as an example, but uh, my son Steve uh, married a young lady from the Philippines, and she, I love her. She's, I love her dearly, like my own daughter. But, um, there's a lot of difference in the culture, in, even in the way they raise children. See? A lot of folks from that part of the world and from Asia, they don't believe in, in, in physical disciplining their children. My son grew up in my house. He thinks that's the only way you talk to them. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? So there's, you know, and, and there's, there's, some, there's some issues there. But usually they're not racial. They're, they have to do with culture. Now, again, there's an exception to everything. And I'm not saying, and I, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that it's bad or wrong uh, for, in, for someone of this culture to marry somebody from another culture. But you may have to overcome some cultural things and make some adjustments. And you're going to have to do it. Uh, and it's not an impossible thing. And, um, but I'm just simply saying that... Uh, that um, you know, you just you need to think about those things and try to think about it. It may not be a problem at all, but it could be. So you have to think about those things. Um, the same thing has to do. I didn't put this down, but sometimes uh, it, it's important that people find someone that someone in the same academical uh, academic level in that area of interest. Um, I think people need to have, have, those, uh, have that area, uh, have some things in common there. Um, you ought to find someone that has a good relationship with his or her parents because you don't just marry a husband or a wife. You marry families. And that, uh, mother, or that mother or that mother uh, or that dad that you can't stand is going to be the grandfather or grandmother of your children. 
and uh, it is not, I don't think it's fair to uh, deprive your grandchildren of their grandfather or grandmother just because you don't like them. And so, now I know that again, there's an exception to every rule, but in most cases, um, you need to try to find out what kind of a relationship uh, the girl or the dad or the, or the boy has with their parents. A girl will usually treat her husband the way she treated her dad. She will see because her dad has been the male role model in that home. It's that problem with marriages today. Many, many homes do not have a, a male role model. I am so glad that my mother, when I was a boy, lived and in with, with families and uh, worked with them, my uncles on many occasions and others, and these men were good to me, and they were role models for me. But a lot of boys, a lot of boys don't have, they don't have a father, they don't as a role model or somebody, you know. And a lot of girls, they've, there's never been a dad in the home, there's never been a man there, so they have no idea how to relate to, respond to uh, the opposite sex when they get when they get married. And I'm not blaming the girl, of course. Um, but it's, you know, it's, you need to make sure. And, and, and you know, we, we all uh, wind up in situations that we, had, we didn't make them and we had no choice. And you have to go on with your life. But I'm, I'm looking at what I think would be best. And it certainly is best if you find somebody that has a good relationship with their, with their parents. Because um, when you marry, you are joining families together, not just it's not just you, you know, and, uh, and your husband or your wife. I uh, think you'd be wise to try to, is to seek the approval um, of your parents, if possible. I think that's best. I had two guys to come and see me wanting to marry my daughter. I had others that wanted to, but they were cowards to come in, thank God. Uh, but I had one fellow to come in. He, uh, man, he's the last man in the world I ever wanted to marry her. And uh, so I, I stalled him. He came to me, wanted to marry him. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I know my daughter. She's pretty fickle. And uh, I, I think you'd be wise. And if you want me to have any part in it, I think you, we better buy about uh, at least three to six months' time here to see how things go. He said, well, that sounds fair. And thank God he was out of the picture. Well, another guy, you know, they keep coming, just can't keep them away. And uh, here comes another guy. And he comes in, he, I've told you about him. <clears throat> He's all nervous, hands sweating, mouth dry. He said, I'm really nervous. I said, what are you up to? <laughs> First thing I said to him, what are you up to? He said, well, he said, I, I, love, I love Lisa. I said, and I'd like to marry her. I said, I love her too. And I do. I love her. I mean, um, I love her. The only, you know, I couldn't tell you how much I love her. And um, so we talked a while. And uh, he said, "Well, I'd like to have, I'd like to have your approval." I says, "Well, I said, I tell you what. She's been raised in a Christian home. It's not uncommon, though she's not faithful now. It's not uncommon when young people get married. They've been raised in church all their life that." especially if a baby or something comes along, they decide they want to go to church. And, you know, I'd really like to think that she'd have a husband that would go to church with her. And he said, uh, well, I don't know what this thing of being saved is. He said, do you have to have some kind of tragedy before you can get saved? I thought if you marry her, you're about to have one. <laughs> but that's what he said. You have to have some kind of tragedy, you know. In other words, some folks think you've got to have a tragedy, and that's how you come to God, come to the Lord. But I had the joy, you know, of sitting there in the office and winning him to Christ. And uh, I believe the boy is saved. I really do. <coughs> and uh, But I'm glad. What I'm trying to say is I'm glad that he came to me. I'm glad that he wanted my approval. And he has my approval. He's a good guy. And I like him. I love him. And uh, he's good to my daughter. And that, that's, that's all important. So what I'm trying to say is when you're, 
and, and most, most of you already have your mates. There's a little group over here. But, but uh, I want to say this is you need to find someone who has a good relationship with their parents. Um, you know, that, that's not the whole picture, of course. But you ought to try to seek parental approval when you get ready to get married because, again, you're marrying the whole family. And then the grandchildren come. And they want to go see grandma. And you want to get together and have family things. There may be situations where that cannot happen, but I would try to make it happen if you can. Family is the most important thing you got on this earth. So you need to try to do everything you can to build it. Families are disintegrating, just like bombs going off. And we need to work at trying to work, put them together and keep them together. Um, I think you ought to find someone who sincerely loves the Lord. And that takes time. And in this culture, you have the opportunity to do that. Certainly, uh, uh, Rachel and Leah may not have had that privilege. Rebecca didn't have that choice necessarily. But you have that choice. And uh, don't believe that because a guy is a good soul winner, he'll be a good husband. They are not related. Don't assume that because a guy has a lot of positions in church that he's a good choice for a husband. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, just because a guy has the biggest bus route doesn't mean he's a good husband. There's no connection between the ministries that a man or a woman has in the church and their qualifications for a husband or a wife. Because that's what a lot of kids, they make that mistake in school. They think because the guy's the number one soul winner, he'll, he's spiritual, and that he'll be a number one husband or she'll be a number one wife. It isn't so. It isn't so. There's a difference in these things and a, a person just being spiritual. And uh, it's not something that's put on. It's not an act. Uh, if you get to know somebody, you'll see it in their character. And uh, it'll develop itself in manners and respect. And they want to protect you, not take advantage of you. Anybody ever says to you, if you love me, you would, hit them upside the head with a high heel shoe. That's not love. So find someone who sincerely loves the Lord, and this person will not be selfish, this person will not be possessive, and this person will, be, will not be insecure. Uh, nothing worse than marrying into someone who's very insecure. And every time you go through the Rolodex, they're behind you trying to see if you called a girl or something. You know, and they're <laughs> checking your cell phone number to see who you dial last. Uh, I feel sorry for people that are that insecure. And, they're, you know, they're, it's a miserable life. And you need to marry somebody you can trust, and then you need to trust them. Just say, fear hath torment. And he that, it, that the Bible says, he that hath fear is not made perfect in love. So you need to find somebody who, who loves the Lord and uh, they're not selfish. It'll demonstrate itself in that they're not selfish. Watch them when they go out with you and see how thoughtful they are of you. See? If the guy just starts uh, eating like a dog at the table <laughs> and says it's everybody for himself, I say, see you later. See you later. It's not, the manners is not the issue. The manners is symptomatic of something else. It's selfishness. That's my point. Find someone who's able or will provide for you, especially as talking to the ladies. You need to find somebody who will provide for you. I still believe that men are supposed to provide for their wives. Now, I know there are situations when that can't be done. I know there are, there are situations to where men may lose their jobs. I know there are situations to where health may get involved here. But on a regular, normal situation, you will not have a good marriage with the wife going to work and the guy staying at home because the guy will become insecure. He'll become very insecure. And uh, he will see it as her money. And um, he'll begin to, to lose his, uh, 
is sense of uh, masculinity, and it leads to all kinds of problems. And so when you're looking for somebody, especially you ladies, when you're looking for somebody to marry, of course that's not the number one thing. I know with some of you that probably is the number one thing, you know. But that's not the number one thing, but it is important. It's very important. Security is, especially to a woman, a woman's on the top of the list. And that's okay. That's always the way it's been. God's plan was that the man would take care of his family. And a man doesn't feel good if he can't take care of his family. It does something to his, to his masculinity. He wants to provide. He wants to provide. See? He likes to do it. Men like to do things for their wives, whether you women believe it or not. In fact, the truth is, every man in here who loves his wife would rather please her than anybody on this planet. He'd rather please her. And you ought to let him know every once in a while. You know, I really appreciate that. It'd be okay. You'll get a lot of mileage out of that. But when you're looking for a mate, think about somebody. You know, if <laughs> I have to be careful what I say here. But let me just say that don't marry someone with the idea that we're going to live on love. It won't pay the rent. It won't pay the rent. It won't buy the groceries. They want hard, cold cash. And kissy, kissy won't get it. So you ought to make sure the guy has a job. Really, you ought to make sure he's got a job. And you ought to make sure that, uh, you know, and I, you don't go around checking his bank account and all that kind of stuff. But I'm simply saying use some common sense. If a guy won't work, and just because a guy's driving a big flashy car doesn't mean he's got any money. See, you may think he's got money because of the nice car he's driving. He may be five payments behind on the payments. See. So find someone who is able and will provide for you. That is important. And it's not important when you first get married. My wife and I got married. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about bank accounts. I didn't care about houses. I didn't care about stocks. I didn't care about bonds. I didn't care about world peace. I didn't care about nuclear war. I didn't care about the ozone. I didn't care about, I cared about one thing. <laughs> now I know that, bot, that shocks some of you. <laughs> but one day, click, the light come on. We got to pay the heat bill, <laughs> especially if you live in Wenatchee in the wintertime. I got married in November. <laughs> On the way back from our wedding, tore the transmission out of my car. Over $400 on the way back from the honeymoon. I didn't have $400. I probably had to buy, borrow $37 to buy the license. She had to love me. Or something. <laughs> now, I don't think I'm lazy. I've worked. My wife has never had, and I've said this repeatedly, she's never had to work out of the home, ever. Never. And I worked uh, in the orchards, pruning apple trees, picking up props, propping limbs, worked in coal storages and warehouses and ran trucks and tractors, dug ditches, worked on the railroad. Uh, did roofing. It's okay. It's just a means to an end. It's okay. It's how God fed us and took care of us. I have no regrets. But I am simply saying that you'd better, when you think about marriage, just come down out of the clouds for a second and think about you have to pay bills. And I'll talk about that in another message about what things that cause divorce. Find a wife who will follow and a husband who will lead. I saw a sign not long ago. It said, lead, follow, or get out of the way. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. Now, I don't have any respect or any time. You know, and I, I, you know I'm from the pulpit. I try to be forceful in my preaching. But I'm really a, a, a pushover. I'm not tough. Uh, I, I, don't, I'm a, I, don't, I don't like fighting. I avoid them. 
as much as I can. And uh, <clears throat> I don't have any respect for a man who is unkind to his wife. I have no respect for that person. I have no respect for a man that physically touches his wife as far as, as uh, hurting her, hitting her, or anything. Uh, I don't think, I don't, you don't cuss, you don't, you're not unkind to him. But I still think that a man needs to take the leadership. Somebody needs to. Give it to the dog or something, but somebody needs to take the leadership, right? And the truth is, almost every woman expects and wants her husband to take the leadership. She, she wants it. She gets security. Now, um, I, don't, I don't just run out here and buy major items without talking to my wife about them. I could, but then I might, no. I, I, <laughs> but I don't do it. I wouldn't, go buy, I wouldn't go buy a car. I wouldn't go buy a truck. I wouldn't go buy a piece of furniture. I wouldn't go buy a boat. I wouldn't go buy, a, I wouldn't do any of that without talking to my wife about it. Not because I have to. I respect her. I want her to be part of the decisions that I make. And many times I'll ask her about the smallest matter because I want her opinion. And then I go ahead and do what I want to, <laughs> but I want her opinion. And, 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 and many times, I mean, she'll never know how many, but many times her opinion has, has really helped me make that decision. It's different from the decision I was going to make. So two things. Don't feel like that you have to go to your wife and get permission about decisions that you make. And a wife should not put her husband in a position to where he has to think that he, she, he has to have her permission on these decisions. But I think because you love your wife and respect your wife, you ought to bring her into the decision making and the planning. You understand what I'm saying? So then, when you think about getting married, you need, to, you, need to, you need to find someone who will lead if you are the wife, and you need to find somebody who will follow. And the chances are she won't follow dad, she won't follow you. I don't know. But you need to make sure that that'll happen. I may be wrong. I may be making a, the, the colossal mistake of my life. But if I, res if I told my wife, I'm going to resign this church this week, and I'm going to take a church in uh, Podunk Holler, Hawaii. She'd say, that'll be fine. <laughs> or it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter where I said. It might matter in that an area. She might have a preference in an area, but it wouldn't make any difference. She'd go. If I said I want to sell the house, she'd say, why? I'd say, why? Here's why. I think it's the right, I really think it's the right thing to do. She'd say, okay, sell it. She would. She'd say, sell it. See? But I wouldn't make that decision without talking to her about it because I respect her and I love her. I wouldn't just go and say, pack up, we're leaving. I got more respect for her than that. But I don't do it because I feel I have to. I want to do it. And so you need to, in, in, in your choices you make, you need to find somebody who will, who will lead and who will follow. And by the way, husband, if you are going to assume the leadership, you are going to assume the responsibility. Because responsibility goes with the leadership. You can't take the leadership and then blame your wife because things don't go well. That's what goes with the territory. Leadership takes responsibility. And so you're responsible. Okay? All right. <clears throat> A couple more here. Find someone who's not hung up on their appearance. <laughs> I mean, every Sunday we have two or three models that come in. They're about 13 or 15, you know. But they're, they're, they're just, you can just tell. They've been watching Britney. They've been watching, you know, who, you don't know who they're watching, you know. Uh, you know, but they've been watching the 700 Club, the gal with all the hair and the eyelashes, you know. And, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's disgusting. We're not impressed. 
We're not impressed with how much of your belly you can show. Get some clothes on. Really. If you really think flesh is pretty, go home and take all your clothes off and stand in, in front of a mirror and see how pretty you look. You're not as pretty that way as you think you are. So find somebody that's not hung up on their looks. Did you ever, did you ever get around somebody and, 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 you know, maybe you're out on a sidewalk and you're talking to them? Or you're in an office and you've got a full-length mirror in there. And while you're talking to them, they're checking themselves out. I used to, the truth is, when I lived in Soap Lake, I'll never forget this guy. I don't know his name, but I worked with him at Boeing. And I, I'll never forget, <coughs> he was there in Soap Lake, and our house had this huge plate glass window in it. It reflected just like a mirror. And this is the first time I ever noticed anybody doing this. But this guy, while he was talking to me, wasn't even looking at me. He was looking, and I watched him. He'd get his comb out, you know. He was looking in the mirror, and boy, his hair was slick. He had brill cream on it, you know, and he was a cool dude. And uh, he, you know, and, uh, but all the time he was looking in the mirror. I, somebody the other day, I'll not tell you who, but somebody that, <laughs> that you know <laughs> that, uh, and I can be bribed, I'll tell you that. But... Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I watched this person. They kept checking themselves out in the mirror. Now, mirrors, of course, are to be used. But if you're with somebody that's obsessed with their appearance and uh, they, you know, clothes and jewelry and hair and makeup is everything, uh, I probably would, um, I probably would, uh, you know, just be careful. Because when looks is everything, uh, you've got a problem on your hand. Because these China dolls get old. They don't always have their beauty. Beauty has to really be inside. We don't like people because they're beautiful. We don't like men, uh, ladies, because they're handsome. Beautiful women and beautiful men or handsome men may be nice to look at, but they're not necessarily nice to live with. Beauty is something that's on the inside. It's in your character. It's in your personality. And I can't use any names. I, can't, I don't dare do that. But I look back and think about some of the people in our church that were the most beautiful. But they were beautiful on the inside. We like people because not by how they look. We're attracted to people by how they look. We're attracted to people by how they look. But that's just a, just a momentary thing. And pretty soon it has to do with, with, um, with, with, with reality and character and kindness and all those uh, qualities. Find someone who's not hung up on their appearance. <laughs> Number 10, and last of all, find somebody who cares about their appearance. Right? Sure. I mean, if a, if, a, if a gal didn't care about her appearance, <laughs> she's got a problem. And a guy didn't care about his appearance. But my point, I use the word hang up, obsessive. But you need to find somebody that does care about their appearance. If a guy's got dirty fingernails all the time, you know, and he works in an office, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'd avoid that guy. Now, if he's a mechanic, if he's a mechanic, if he's a mechanic or a ditch digger, it's a little bit different, you know, you can understand it, but, but if a guy works in an office or is a, is a student in the classroom all the time and he, he's still got dirty knuckles, you know, up to his wrist, you, you know, you need to avoid this guy. You know why? Well, he's dirty. He's lazy. If his ankles are rusty or he's got rust behind his ears, you know, Never seen a never seen a dish a, a washcloth. Sometimes this is the truth. So funny. Sometimes someone will come by. They're going up the street. They want to come in to use the phone or use the bathroom or borrow some money or something. <sighs> more times than more times than once, I've seen my wife. 
following right behind where they walked where she's got this can of spray. <laughs> she's spraying the room. They're gone, thank God. But she's spraying the room, you know, because they've left a distinct trail where they've gone through. Flowers are just wilting. <laughs> so you need to find someone who cares, somebody who'll take a bath. Girls ought to look nice. But you know what you ought to do is try to attract people to your face. Attract them to your face. A man ought to be able to look at you and feel comfortable looking at you. There's a gal that used to come to this church. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I, 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 I hoped she wouldn't even come by to talk to me because her dress was too short on both ends. That's the truth. And I'm not talking about 13 and 15 years old. I'm talking about 40 and plus, getting up in the desperate <laughs> years. Now, she's a nice lady, I guess. I don't know. But I, uh, you know, men want to be able to look at you and talk to you without you know, <laughs> right? So put the emphasis on the face. This is going downhill. <laughs> Find someone who cares about their appearance, but certainly they're modest in their appearance. Do you know the Bible doesn't tell you how to dress or what to wear? It doesn't tell you what to wear. It just says that women ought to dress modestly. They ought to be modest in apparel. A dress isn't always modest. It isn't. A lot of dresses are very immodest. And they go to the ankles. So, you know, when you get into this kind of thing on telling people how to dress, I think you're getting into trouble. But I'm just saying as a pastor, when you're looking for a mate, be sure it's not someone who's hung up on their appearance and to where they care more about how they look than they are being with you. And at the same time, you need to be with someone who cares about their appearance. They need to take a bath every day. It's okay. My mother, bless her heart, she grew up in the Depression. She had to get water from the spring, you know, and heat it on a stove. When you have to walk two miles to a spring and carry water back, and heat it in a galvanized tub and take a bath. You don't do that every day. You do it Saturday <laughs> night before church. And you share the water, I guess. They used some of the little kids used to do that, you know. You, you can't even conceive of that, can you? I can't either. I mean, when you have to skim the water to take a bath in it, that's bad. But I'm simply saying my mother had this idea that you don't have to take a bath every day. And we got three bathrooms and showers and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I'd, my wife is a witness. She's here. I had, I'd almost physically have to take her in and say, Mom, you're going to take And she would, you know, she's getting old and she couldn't control her, her, her bladder. And she would uh, go to the doctor and say, can you give me something so I won't smell so bad? He says, take a bath. <laughs> Pretty soon I just forced her, I says, Mom, you're going to take a bath every day. First thing, get her out of bed, take her in, and give her her bath. But you ought to take a bath. Use some deodorant. Comb your hair. Put on clean, and don't just take a bath and put on the same old dirty underclothes. Put on clean underclothes. You say. Here's what we've said. There is no such thing as a right mate. You have the right mate if you are married. I'm going to say it again. You have the right mate if you are married. And you don't have an excuse saying, well, I, I think I, I missed, you know, I, I didn't, maybe God, you know, forget it. You are married. And... Um, you just work on it. Marriage, you work on marriages. You drop an egg, you make an omelet. You get a lemon, you make lemonade. You work on it. 
I didn't say this, but you ought to take divorce out of your dictionary. I have never in 46 or 7 or 8 or 9 years, whatever, I have never mentioned the word divorce to my wife. Never. Never. I'm not going to threaten her with a divorce. She might take me up on it. You understand? Take it out of your vocabulary. When you start thinking and thinking and thinking about a divorce, you will find a way to make it happen. Get it out of your vocabulary. Find someone of, you know, of the opposite sex. Find someone, uh, find someone with the same religious values that you have. Solomon's marriages destroyed the whole nation of Israel. Find someone with the same cultural background, if possible. Find someone who has a good relationship with their parents. Find someone who sincerely loves the Lord. This person will not be selfish, possessive, or insecure. Find someone who's able to and will provide for you. Find a wife who will follow and a husband who will lead. Find someone who is not hung up on their appearance. And find someone who cares about their appearance. Well, we're sorry they're all taken. Joked. Thank you. Um, okay. Now, when you're in love, you usually are in love with love or the feeling of love. And I don't know that that's bad. I, it, maybe it's good. Stay together. Work together. Grow together. Plan together. Weep together. It is not a rose garden. It's not, it's not paradise. It's marriage. Sickness comes with it. Disappointment comes with it. Children come with it. Death comes with it. Heartache comes with it. But companionship comes with it. And support comes with it. And someone you can share your life with comes with it. And it has, it's, it has both sides. There's the negative side and the positive side. And you can't have a marriage without it. And just because things aren't going well, it doesn't mean it's time to take off. It means it's time to regroup and see what the problem is and work it out and go on. It's growing. Everybody has problems. You know, I mean, people hear about the idealistic, they don't exist. They're just in movies and books. I mean, don't you know the people who make the movies and write the books can't keep their marriages together? So figure it out. It ain't real. This is reality right here. And this is the help to get you through the reality. Let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you for your love to us. I pray you'll bless these folks. I pray that you'll help them in their marriages, in the choices that they have to make, help them with their children. I pray for these young people. I pray, God, you'll encourage them and strengthen them. I pray if there's someone here tonight that needs to either get saved or baptized or join this church, I pray you'll help them to step forward and move forward in their service for Christ. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for our fathers and our mothers, our families, our husbands and wives, and help us to be good spouses and good parents. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right, let's stand together, and what are we singing? 282. Number 282, if you need to come, and uh, for any reason, you come on the very first stanza of number 282. 282. Just as I am. That thy blood, that thy blood was, shed was shed for me, for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Keep singing, keep praying, come on. Just as I am and waiting not to rid 
my soul of one dark blood. number five just as i am thou wilt we'll welcome pardon wilt welcome pardon cleanse redeem because thy promise because thy 